few uh, scientific or cultural developments in the last few hundred years at least have had the sort of revolutionary impact um, that evolutionary theory, Darwinianism, had in the 19th century. And very few have sparked quite as much controversy. We're going to be looking at, in particular, uh, the implications of Darwinism in social thought, a movement called social Darwinism, in the person of uh, the writings of, I should say, William Graham Sumner, a Yale professor in the 19th century and probably America's most famous social Darwinist. Before we do that, however, I, I should mention a few features about Darwin and, and the impact of evolutionary theory, the ways in which that impact made possible the development of this positive social science that we now know as social Darwinism. More than anything else, evolutionary theory undermined Christianity. It undermined Christianity and the moral tradition which had grown up around it and which had dominated most of Western discourse about politics and society. Now, evolutionary theory did this because on the surface it clearly contradicted the biblical account of humanity found in Genesis. All right. Now, Again, this is not to suggest that this is an entirely new departure. We'd seen with the Newtonian revolution that much of the biblical account of our solar system had been challenged. Nonetheless, the Newtonian system was not entirely antithetical to a theistic view of the universe. Theists could still point to the distinct nature of humans as intelligent animals uh, that have properties of soul or of mind, which are distinct from anything found in the animal kingdom. And it was uh, assumed that while, yes, science and Newton may have explained the actions of gross matter, it had not been able to explain the uh, existence and properties of intelligent matter of humans. And in that way, you would still have to resort to uh, God as an explanation. And of course, that's exactly where evolutionary theory stepped in. Natural selection uh, and the rest of evolutionary theory raised doubts about these last vestiges of what we could call the ancient argument from design. That, in fact, you could explain the origins of uh, human intelligence without resort to an intelligent creator. Moreover, the idea, the sense of nature changed dramatically with Darwin. Remember, the Newtonian universe was tailor-made for the argument from design. It was an orderly universe, mechanical, symmetrical. It was law-like. It never wasted. Uh, it was, as it were, uh, the sort of universe that an intelligent clockmaker would make. Darwin's nature, on the other hand, was entirely different. Darwin's nature was nothing if not wasteful. Right? the vast bulk of species that ever existed have already become extinct. Nature will make a thousand species, and if five survive and are adaptive, it had a good day. So this conception of nature as wasteful, capricious, irrational, amoral, um, it was very often summed up with the phrase, nature is red in tooth and claw. And that kind of a nature doesn't fit in with the, the idea that it's created by a beneficent and uh, gentle, orderly creator. It's a much more chaotic sort of uh, environment. Well, Darwin's theory not only, therefore, challenged the Christian sense of man as a distinct creation, it, it naturalized man. It argued that man had, in fact, obviously descended from an ancestor, which we share with certain primates, uh, but also argued that human intelligence was not something sui generis, was not something uniquely human. It had developed to a higher degree in humans, but we could see elements of intelligence, of reasoning in other uh, higher uh, animals and other primates. Uh, we could see evidences of the beginning of social organization, of emotional responses, of nurturance in other species. And in that way, much of what was thought to be distinctively human was shown to be continuous with uh, nature and its environment. Now, this naturalizing of humanity, as I've, I've tried to suggest here, inevitably results in, as well, a naturalizing of society. In the case of social Darwinism, uh, and in the case of Darwin himself, this meant that instead of thinking of society as an organic unity of free and independent beings, 
society was now very much like nature itself, a competitive struggle for existence. There was something natural about humans having to fight against each other and against nature to eke out survival. Um, now, I should point out that this influence ran both directions, which is to say it is true that the Darwinian belief in natural uh, selection and survival of the fittest, the struggle for existence, had a profound influence on social thought. But it also ran in the other direction. Uh, Darwin was profoundly influenced by Malthus. Um, Malthus had uh, written a uh, rather dismal account of the influence of wage increases on populations. He argued that if you increased the wages of workers, they'd simply breed in greater numbers, which would mean there would be more workers for a set number of jobs, which would depress wages. So there was a, a sort of iron law uh, of low wages, right? That raising wages would only ultimately wind up lowering them by increasing the number of workers through um, the creation of progeny. And that idea of struggle for scarce resources had a profound impact on Darwin. That was the key to his finding his own mechanism of uh, <clears throat> natural selection. Um, in, indeed, even the phrase survival of the fittest was drawn from, Dar uh, Darwin drew it from the writings of Herbert Spencer, who was a famous social Darwinist who actually wrote before Darwin. Um, in any case, what we can clearly see is that there's a strong conjuncture between the belief in the struggle for existence within nature and the notion that society should be like that and is, in fact, like that. It's a market struggle for scarce resources. Now, I've mentioned Herbert Spencer um, because while in many ways his was the most impressive version of social Darwinism and certainly the most philosophically elaborate, and it was really the source from which Sumner derived a lot of his own thought, social Darwinism never had in England the kind of impact it had in, in the United States in the late 19th century. It's hard for us to get a sense of this because no sooner was it embraced that within a generation it was completely rejected. But for a generation, it dominated the American Academy and American culture. It captivated the public imagination, at least of, of the uh, literate and um, intellectually engaged uh, portion of that population. And there are several reasons for this. Um, perhaps not least of which would be uh, that if there was any place in the world that approximated a social Darwinist policy, polity, it would have been the 19th century, late 19th century United States. Uh, it, we certainly had the weakest internal um, state. We had the least regulation of industry. And this was the period that was, uh, is often referred to as the Gilded Age of American capitalism. Uh, I think Mark Twain called it the Great Amar American Barbecue. Uh, where robber barons, huge industrial combinations uh, were created. People like Andrew Carnegie and U.S. Steel, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, all of the, and uh, the Morgans and uh, various banking combinations all uh, emerged at this moment. And these were the sort of uh, great men who one explained their, their power as people who could survive in this cockpit struggle for existence. Well, the social Darwinism of Sumner, of William Graham Sumner, uh, it, particularly in the text we're going to look at, which is a, a, a book called What Social Classes Owe to Each Other, represents really the conjuncture of several different cultural strains. He was a, a, socio, a professor of sociology at Yale, and very much his writings do epitomize uh, an American attempt in that generation to formulate a positive social science. And we should be very clear, social Darwinism is part of a larger sort of high cultural movement that's called positivism in the late 19th century. Um, it's associated with the belief that uh, science is the most reputable form of knowledge, that sentimentality is out of place in trying to analyze uh, phenomena, um, and that nature is made up of discrete processes which cannot be profoundly affected by the human will. But it also represents a scientifically grounded defense of industrial capitalism. I mean, the one thing you, you can't ignore, it's so incredibly obvious, is that social Darwinism is a defense of that great American barbecue of the Gilded Age of American capitalism. And with it, its traditional notion of laissez-faire, that the government should keep its hands off as the economy develops. 
But there's one other element which generally is ignored in social Darwinism, which I think is very important. And that is that it also represents a peculiarly American uh, confidence in the inevitability of social, political, and moral progress. Part of social Darwinism, and is very often associated with a sort of gloomy gust view of society, is the belief that left in its own, human progress is inevitable and, and, and must occur and will occur if we don't get in its way. Um, now, Sumner's social Darwinism is based on a sort of historically materialist conception of the relation between and development of uh, capital and labor, the two great forces of the 19th century. And it's an uh, analysis that shares certain elements with, on the one hand, classical political economy, sort of thing we find with Smith and Ricardo, and on the other, actually, the historical materialism of uh, Marx and Engels. Let's begin with the definition of capital. Uh, and that bears a, a lot of similarities. It obviously derives from the Lockean tradition, but it bears some similarities to what we find in Marx and Engels. Capital is, for Sumner, uh, simply accumulated labor, as he puts it, raised to a higher power, as the mathematicians say. I think the basic notion that he's trying to get at is that capital includes all of the basic factors of production, uh, that, uh, with the exception of labor. So in Marxian terms, it would include both forces and means of production. What do we mean by that? Capital is things like factories, tools. It's also uh, cash, assets that can be used to purchase labor. It's facilities, plants. Now, Sumner argues that, in fact, capital is the key to social development. Right? Because it's capital, these resources, that allow us to use, or uh, to use the common the, the uh, postmodern term, deploy a society's productive forces, right? Its technologies, its skills. Without capital, these uh, productive forces are never used efficiently in the struggle for existence and mastery over nature. In fact, Sumner argues that if you take a long view of human history, of post-biological evolution, the key to development is, in fact, capital. The first form of capital Sumner proposes was probably fire, that first technology, followed by flint tools. That was capital. It was labor that had been congealed in productive um, technique and in material and could be used to produce other things like animal hides, uh, needles, bone tools, uh, traps for catching other animals, etc., etc. And then there's obviously a progress, a development of productive powers, all because of capital. Now, the intuitive notion here is that capital first emerges as technology and as tools. And since it's the development of tools that distinguish humans from other species, right? We are, as it were, homo faber, the animal that produces. Sumner is arguing that it's capital in the form of tools and means of production that differentiates humanity, our species, from what he calls the brutes from other beasts. So what differentiates us is not that we're made in God's image, or not that we have intelligence even, because our other animals have it too, but rather that we develop capital at a very early stage in our progress. Um, from this assumption follows the conclusion that private property and capital is therefore, and has always been, the essential element, the sine qua non, of civilized life and human progress. Now, clearly, this is not a view shared by the historical materialism of Marx and Engels. But there is something, nonetheless, that, that's common here. Both are committed to viewing history, ultimately, as a story about the development of humanity's productive powers, um, powers that develop in a progressive fashion, where we, over time, increasingly develop mastery and conquest over nature. And it's that conquest. Uh, which allows us to solve the problem of scarcity. And that's the basic structure that's shared both by the positivism of Marx and Engels and the positivism of the social Darwinists. There's differences as well. Sumner seems to agree, uh, and in fact be a precursor of Toynbee in arguing that this sort of progress in the development of productive forces uh, 
really occurs primarily in particular sorts of regions of the globe, regions where the challenge for survival is neither too easy, in which case there's never any reason to develop capital, or too difficult. Uh, basically, that means temperate zones like we find in Europe, where uh, labor will uh, gather up. We need labor uh, and productive technology to be able to feed ourselves, uh, but we don't need uh, to be so focused on it that we have to put a tremendous amount of time into just uh, gaining our survival. And I guess the contrast would be on the one hand the tropics, where it's very easy to survive without doing much in the way of technological development, or say the Arctic circle, where uh, no matter how much technology you have, you're always very close to uh, um, starvation. Okay. Well, if it is the case that capital is the key to human development and the key to mastery over nature, then it follows that capital must always be employed with an eye to maximizing efficiency. Right? Remember, Sumner accepts the Malthusian calculus about populations, which means that as the standard of living increases, populations will continue to increase with them. What that means is that a civilized industrial society will constantly be increasing its number of probably poorest people, its workers, who will always be uh, a few steps away from, literally, uh, failing in the struggle for existence. The only way an industrial society, therefore, can ensure that such people are not marginalized to the point of starvation is to constantly develop its productive powers, to keep ahead of, as it were, a sort of hunger curve. And it can only do that if it uses its capital in the most efficient way possible. If it wastes capital, if it uses it inefficiently, and as we'll see, Sumner believes that social welfare legislation is just that. It's an inefficient use of capital. The result will not be so much that you'll be soaking the rich, but rather, and I quote him, your society will, quote, fall back toward that natural state of barbarism from which it rose. And in so doing, it must sacrifice thousands of its weakest members. So a failure to employ capital in its most efficient, productive uh, manner will, in fact, uh, have the most deleterious effects for the poorest people. On the other hand, a continued um, efficient use of capital, which will probably mean more and more aggregation in large um, uh, industrial combines like U.S. Steel or, or um, uh, Standard Oil, will continue to generate the sort of dynamic economic expansion that the late 19th century saw, which benefits everyone. It's a rising tide that lifts all ships. Well, that's his analysis of capital. His analysis of labor is also, in many ways, historical. He argues that if you look at the history of labor and labor forms uh, leading up to the modern condition, it's basically a narrative about the slow but steady increase in the freedom and dignity of the worker. He begins in primitive societies, where he thinks the basic form of labor is patriarchal slavery. Men engage in war, and they hunt. Women do almost all of the work. At a certain point, as civilization emerges, that condition is generalized. So we have a sort of the general slavery of antiquity, which is eventually ameliorated in serfdom, villainage. We finally get guild structures in the late medieval period, where uh, producers start to uh, combine and, con and, and contract to, to get themselves better working conditions. And finally, in recent centuries, this emerges as the modern system of free labor. This modern system, unlike previous systems, is not based on coercion, as in slavery. It's not based on hierarchy, as in feudalism. It's based on voluntary contract. Workers are now free to contract uh, their labor in the form of wages. And this is he thinks, the triumph of freedom with a capital F. In such a free society like the United States, we are held together not by the hangman, not by the coercive powers of the police, but by voluntary agreement and cooperation. Right? And it's that voluntary uh, agreement and cooperation that has displaced the dead hand of coercion and hierarchy that affected previous societies. Now, Sumner is aware this system has its drawbacks. Right? Part of what you give up when you become a free and autonomous individual, working class individual, is the security of a traditional hierarchical society with its notions of noblesse oblige. But Sumner believes, and, and feels quite strongly, that nonetheless it's, it's a, a, a fair 
uh, bargain. It, you got the better of the deal when you became free. And he has an excellent example right at hand. He said, look, there are people who will point out that since the freeing of the uh, um, African-American slaves with the end of the Civil War, um, many of the freedmen no longer can be assured of an income in their old age, as they might have been before. They can no longer be assured of medical care in case they get sick. They can no longer be assured of some sort of at least basic dietary and clothing sustenance for their children in hard times. And so they've definitely lost something. But he says, now, would anyone seriously imagine that even with all these drawbacks, uh, African Americans in the 19th century would prefer to be slaves than free, even if they know that they may not be taken care of in their old age. That's the price you pay for freedom. And his argument, I think it's quite a cogent one, is that even with those prices, you would find very few uh, African Americans in the late 19th century who would have said, well, it's too high a price to pay. Um, we can, in fact, defend, as Sumner does, this structure of modern free labor society by contrasting it with its real option, what preceded it, the feudal society. A feudal society was based on status, on hierarchy, on birth. Um, and it was also based on sentiment, right? That's its appealing feature. We find sentiment in chivalrous literature, in religious enthusiasm, in crusades, and of course in noblesse oblige, the belief that those who are on the top of the social pyramid uh, need to uh, dispense some social goods to those at the bottom. Right? That's the old system. Our new system is based on contract and rationality. And there's no doubt we've lost something, right? This modern society, this rationality, is cold. It's abstract. It's very often self-interested. And therefore, it's out of place with the sort of sentiment, which was ennobling in the um, feudal period. Nonetheless, I don't think, uh, or Sumner doesn't think there's any question that the modern society is much freer, it's more productive, and fundamentally, it's stronger. And in a natural setting, the strong always win out over the weak. So while we've lost the sort of sentimentality, which he thinks is the very essence of social reform, while we've lost that sentimentality, that again is a price we have to pay, and it's a price well worth paying for progress in both freedom and strength. Okay. Having said that, the question then becomes, or one of the issues, especially the late 19th century, was the condition of labor and its wages. And Sumner is very straightforward about this. Uh, the critical factor that determines the wages of workers is supply and demand, the, supply, uh, the, the demand for labor and the supply of workers in the labor force. Um, what this leads to for Sumner is that self-interested workers will realize that it's in their own best interest to limit the number of workers. And the best way to do this is birth control, is by limiting their number of progeny. Right? Consider what it takes to acquire capital, which is what one needs to live uh, you know, a fully rich life. It requires, fundamentally, self-denial, the worldly asceticism that Weber associated with um, capital accumulation. Well, it's very difficult to practice that self-denial for each individual. It's much more difficult to practice that kind of denial when you have children and a wife. Therefore, uh, if you want to acquire that sort of capital, the best thing you can do is forego having a family until you do have that capital. In fact, Sumner argues it's the height of irresponsibility to have a family until you've acquired some capital. Um, if those who are less successful in the struggle for existence within the working class would abstain from having families, the working class would have less but stronger men, men who had been invested with more capital and more resources. Now, there's two points I want to make about this, this discussion of populations. One is that it sounds very hard-hearted and an anti-working class. Um, it's certainly not sentimental. I don't know that it's hard-hearted. Sumner's father was a worker. He was a you know, working-class man, and he practiced the sort of virtues some, that Sumner is proposing. Sumner claims you know, social Darwinism. Yeah, I read it from, from uh, Spencer, and I got it from reading Darwin, but you know, it was also basically what my father taught me on his knee, self-denial sacrifice. Uh, but there's another side to it as well. Sumner is inadvertently opening one of the most nasty cans of worms uh, of the early 20th century, and that is the whole question of population control and eugenics. Um, and I don't think he had any sense what would come out of it, but there's no question that you can see the beginnings of this eugenic thinking 
that you know the lower classes are breeding too much and uh, you know, uh, the elites just don't have enough children. You can see the first germs of that in this doctrine about labor. Well, one of the characteristic features of all social Darwinists, one of its signal um, elements, and some there's no exception, is their analysis and very critical examination of the proper role and moral stat status of the state and of government. In this regard, Sumner's work has a particular force and cogency, perhaps because the federal government of the United States was among the most internally weak governments of all the major industrial powers. So if there's a, a, a place that is a sort of experiment for uh, the social Darwinian conception of the state, it would certainly be late 19th century America. And at the root of Sumner's thinking on government, is an attempt to radically demystify the state. Right? The state had been, in Sumner's perspective, mystified as a result of, most importantly, nationalism and the writings of Hegel. Right? Hegel had seen that the state was, in fact, the essence of spiritual and moral life, that progress, the spirit, was working itself through the nation's state government. Well, Sumner thinks that the view is a lot of sentimental claptrap. It's, quote, stuff and nonsense, as they would have said in the 19th century. The state is really nothing but all of us. He likes to put in together these little phrases like, quote, all of us. And its principal legitimate concerns are very straightforward. Life, liberty, and property. Right? You protect the life, liberty, and property of its citizens. The state's done its job. Now, this is, the, of course, the classical Lockean triad. Um, but in Sumner's view, this Lockean triad turns out to be practically identical to the Jeffersonian triad, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's because ca it's capital that enables an individual to pursue leisure. And that leisure, that, um, with leisure comes mental, mental cultivation, spiritual cultivation, various things we think conduce to happiness. And so the defense of property allows one to accumulate capital and thus pursue happiness. So the defense of property is, in fact, the defense of the pursuit of happiness. Note pursuit, not happiness itself. Because social Darwinism is at direct odds with utilitarianism. Right? Utilitarianism thought that the purpose of legislation was to promote the happiness of its citizens. The transformation of social Darwinism is, no, the state should allow you to pursue happiness, but your own happiness is something you must achieve. And the state cannot ensure it. In fact, the state should not ensure it. Those who are capable of achieving their happiness deserve it and have earned it. Okay. Well, this brings us to the issue of what allows us to pursue that happiness, which is liberty. And for Sumner, it's critical that we see the distinction between, or that we see, rather, not the distinction, the identity between liberty and civil liberty, because that's what liberty ultimately is. And he defines that as, and I quote, a status created for the individual by laws and institutions, the effect of which is that each man is guaranteed the use of all his own powers exclusively for his own welfare. Right? It is absolutely critical in understanding social Darwinism that such liberty be seen as an end in itself. Liberty is the goal of a good polity. It's never a means to other ends. It's never a means to happiness. It's never a, a means to, quote, social justice or fairness. It's the end itself, liberty. It's also equally important that we realize, for social Darwinism at least, that such liberty accrues only to individuals. Individuals have liberty. Groups don't have liberty. Classes don't have liberty. Institutions don't have liberty. Only individuals. Only individuals have rights, not groups and institutions. Okay. Now, while it's true that only individuals enjoy liberties and rights, the ultimate point of a system of liberty, of a structure of liberty, is to restrain all classes, and he means every class, from infringing on other classes. And Sumner is, you know, he, in his apologist for, for uh, industrial capitalism, he's in no way naive. He's quite clear all classes, uh, owners as well as workers, try to use the state to dominate other classes. They try to use it to extract either labor or capital 
from the other groups in society. It is the purpose of liberty to obstruct that attempt. In fact, Sumner argues, and it's a, a sort of strangely pessimistic view at a point, that all of human political history is the struggle of classes, and again, it sounds like Marx, to dominate the state to exploit other classes. And he argues that, in fact, this generates a sort of Viconian cyclical development in, in, in society. What does that mean? Well, we start out with a, uh, an aristocratic society. At a certain point arise the wealthy, and they fight against the aristocrats and try to take over the state, and they do, and establish a republic. Then the next thing that happens is the common people resist the wealthy, and they try to take over the state to secure their wealth. And then you get a democracy. And then eventually, among them, a, uh, a popular leader emerges to say, let's continue the filching of the, uh, the wealthy, and then you get a dictatorship. And that's obviously the story of the Roman Empire, you know, Caesar, Julius Caesar being the last figure. He says, this is the cycle of history. It always happens like this. And then you start the whole cycle away. How do you break that cycle? You come up with a system of liberty which restrains every class so that they simply can't exploit through the state other classes. This development, the system of liberty, is a modern development. It is not more than about three or four centuries old. And it is the key to the development of modern democracy. If we don't have this system of liberty, we can't have modern democracy. It will ultimately become uh, a dictatorship. And in fact, the key to any sound polity is that uh, the government establish, or that the society establish, rather, an equilibrium between rights and duties. This is destroyed whenever you have a privileged class. And a privileged class is, is a group or a class that has rights, emerges, demands rights, and then shifts the duties to others. So at a certain point, the feudal polity was, in fact, sound. The, most of the rights accrued to the aristocrats, but they had the duty for protecting society, fighting wars. And it was a stable uh, system. At a certain point, the aristocrats stopped fighting wars. They demanded all the rights and privileges of being aristocrats, but they hired professional mercenaries, Swiss people if they were in Italy, or you know, uh, the lower class if they were in England, to fight their wars. Therefore, they had rights without duties. Well, not surprisingly, within a very brief time, the system, the feudal society, falls apart. It's not sound. Well, democracy has a similar danger. In this case, the class that is most likely to be in power, or those classes, which is to say the majority of people, um, have rights, political power, and they're in danger of trying to shift duties to, other, to, to others. And the duty, of course, is the duty of caring for yourself, of providing for yourself. So the danger of democracy is that uh, the majority will plunder those who have, the rich. So one of Sumner's ways of responding to this, he says what you have to do if you have groups that no longer can assume the duty of caring for themselves, dependent paupers, you cannot give them the rights of free men. In other words, he doesn't say, look, if the people are starving, you know, he's not Ebenezer Scrooge. He doesn't say, let them starve to death and, and relieve the excess population. No, we have to support them. But there is no way that you can allow them to vote. That's crazy. They're a privileged class then. They're aristocrats. Um, so you always have to disfranchise dependent paupers lest they become a privileged class with special, quote, entitlements. And this is a phrase which, as we'll see, social Darwinism has, uh, for all of its lack of credibility in the academy, has a profound resonance in, in, in American political thinking. Now, even with this problem of dependent paupers, Sumner is acutely aware that the biggest danger facing American, uh, the American democracy was not the poor, but the rich was the danger of plutocracy, that the wealthy would dominate the state. And he argued, in fact, that the power of wealth, the new middle class that had emerged to displace the old feudal aristocracy, had begun to rival that of the status-oriented power of the aristocracy in the old uh, ancien regime. And I quote, nowhere in the world is the danger of plutocracy as formidable as it is here in the United <coughs> States. To it, we oppose the powers of numbers as it is presented by democracy. So it's the majoritarian nature of democracy that has to stand ever vigilant against the dangers of plutocracy, of the distortion of democracy by the wealthy. And of course, he's quite accurate in diagnosing what is the fundamental technique of plutocracy. It has an army that works for it, and the army is called lobbyists. 
Right? Lobbyists are the, uh, the foot soldiers of the plutocratic uh, reactionary revolution. The basic goal of these lobbies or lobbying organizations of the plutocracy is what he calls jobbery. What is jobbery? Essentially, lobbyists attempt to get the government to spend money uh, to finance corporate ventures. That may be government contracts, defense contracts, building contracts, railroad contracts, uh, protective tariffs, uh, farm subsidies, but is essentially an attempt by the rich to get the government to subsidize their activity. Well, how do you fight against this new danger of plutocracy? He argues that, and again I'm going to quote, the new foes must be met, as the old ones were met, by institutions and guarantees, not by uh, administrative programs. The old constitutional guarantees were all aimed against kings and nobles. New ones must be invented to hold the power of wealth to that responsibility, without which no power whatever is consistent with liberty. The judiciary has given the most satisfactory evidence that it is competent to the new du duty which devolves upon it. And that's the answer that Sumner thinks is probably most likely. The way you restrain the lobby, the way you restrain plutocracy, is with a powerful, independent, constructivist judiciary. And in fact, I think the 20th century has proven to a large extent that, that that's the case. Um, to finish up on this problem then of the state, what do free men owe to each other? They owe each other nothing but civility, law-abiding uh, good nature, and cooperation when it's in their mutual interest, and nothing more. That's the whole point of liberty. You are an autonomous, free individual. Everyone has one fundamental duty, which I've already mentioned, and that is take care of yourself. Work, feed yourself. If, you've, if you can accomplish that, terrific. Then you're free to have a family and take care of them. If you've done that, you've lived a fully productive life and you've done all that your society can ask. A free society gives everyone the liberty to do as they list or as they please, as they think is right. But it gives no one the responsibility to care for someone else who has used his liberty poorly. If you choose to use your liberty in a way that is profligate, that does not maximize your future return on your labor, that's your responsibility. Someone else who's been far more prudent, who has sacrificed for a better future, is in no way responsible to make up for your poor use of liberty. Now, this in no way precludes cooperative activity as long as it's voluntary. We can have cooperative societies. We can have a socialist society as long as it is voluntary, as long as it's not coerced. We still have a free society. In fact, uh, to be fair to Sumner, he called, and one of the things he thought was critical was that America needed a stronger uh, trade union movement among workers. Not necessarily to increase wages. He thought that workers could never do that. That the business cycle increases wages. Strikes only work when uh, the uh, business cycle is on an upswing. Whenever it's on a downswing, they fail anyway. But rather, that workmen through voluntary association and collective bargaining should be able to secure reasonable hours, working conditions, occupational safety and health, place limits on child labor and female labor, and uh, foster what he called an esprit de corps, a sort of proto-class consciousness. And I think his point is, is, is straightforward. He has, remember, he comes from a working class family, has profound respect for the American worker. And his argument is, is it's debasing and patronizing, paternalistic, uh, and frankly, aristocratic to believe that the government has to protect workers' occupational safety and health. The American workers are strong, independent, free people. That's what they should have unions to negotiate for. Okay. Well, probably the most polemical part of Sumner's text is his critique of various schemes of social reform. Um, I should point out that social reform at this period is beginning to take a new thrust. And that thrust is really a result of the development of the Bismarckian social democratic state. Previously, reformers had tried to reform society primarily through raising consciousness. Now, reformers were calling for state intervention, for the sort of things we uh, associate with modern 20th century liberalism. And he's particularly hostile to, to these attempts to use the state to dispense social welfare. He's so hostile as to, in fact, raise embarrassing questions about the motivations of the proponents of social reform. So it's very interesting. The people who call for the state to intervene for the poor are never themselves poor. Right? The poor never call for it. Other people do. 
And these people who call for it are never themselves poor, though they're never wealthy. They seem to be somewhere in the middle. And in fact, in many cases, they seem to be calling for agencies to overlook the poor that will be staffed by, well, themselves. So they seem to be finding jobs for themselves. And whether that helps the poor, well, <laughs> that's a, a rather questionable issue. But at their best, if we don't raise these motivations, at their best, social reformers are naive do-gooders who are sentimental and unscientific. They may be well motivated, but they're like doctors who don't know anything about anatomy. They're more likely to do you harm than good. To understand social and anatomy requires the sort of dispassionate practice of social science that um, is antithetical to the sentimental propensities of reformers fighting for social justice. Moreover, the sentiment of sympathy, which is the basis of our altruism, is not a scientific principle. Right? You may feel the need to give, wide, uh, to give much to, the uh, to ameliorate the suffering of others. But if someone else doesn't feel that, how can you demonstrate that their feeling is not as adequate as your feeling? It's, it's a matter of individual feeling. Um, in, uh, reformers are also uh, guilty of failing to distinguish between natural and social ills. Again, like Marx and Engels, he believes that a lot of scarcity in society, a lot of scarcity of, of income and wealth, is not a function of, of a poorly organized society. It's the fact that our technology can only garner so much from nature. The solution is to increase our, tech, our technology and productive power. Right? There's never any point in moralizing over nature. I, until we have those powers, we simply have to endure the hardships of scarcity that nature foists upon us until we can turn the tables on her by developing our technologies. On the other hand, he acknowledges we have inherited a vast number of social ills. But ironically, and I quote, they are the complicated products of all the tinkering, muddling, and blundering of social doctors in the past. Now, implicit in this is the belief that if you could get rid of the tinkering of do-gooders from previous centuries, society would actually be somehow natural and naturally competitive. And Sumner believes that in fact, one of the purposes of social science might be to allow us to, and I'm going to quote, gain some ground slowly to the word the elimination of old errors and the reestablishment of a sound and natural social order, a social order that's competitive. Now, all of these attempts to ameliorate social ills and fight for equality under the name of social justice ignore one of the basic fundamental facts for Dum Sumner, and that is that liberty and equality of opportunity are antithetical. They are opposites, given the fact that there's a variation within the species. Liberty and equality in a competitive uh, environment, right, where we all have the same rights and opportunities, should and must generate dramatically disparate results. Those who are more prudent, who have more talent, who are more intelligent, who are more resourceful, should naturally succeed much more than others. And that's good. That's right. That's as it should be. The virtue of such inequalities is that they're based on natural differences in aptitude and behavior that can be transmitted across generations. For example, uh, in our case, we could say corporate executives, CEOs, are paid huge sums of money, not because it's socially unfair, but because the organizational and man managerial skills that they possess are extremely rare. And so they have to be rewarded uh, in, in extremely handsome fashion if we're going to use capital in the most efficient way possible. Two more critiques of, the, uh, of reformism I want to mention and then sum up. One is what he calls the forgotten man. Every, state, every scheme for social reform takes the following form. We have a reformer, and he says, what we need to do is take uh, money, resources, or something or other from you know, people in general and give it to the poor man. Now, that's justified by looking at the case of the poor or the weak. It's never justified by looking at the case of the person you're taking it from. That the person you're taking it from is, in fact, the forgotten man. He says, let's look at the forget, forgotten man and how this works. Suppose we say, we're going to tax rich people, rich capitalists, so that they pay for, uh, give money to the poor. He says, well, OK, you take some dollars from the rich person. But remember something, that doesn't really hurt the rich person. He has lots of dollars. You take that dollar from him, what would he have done if you hadn't taken him and given it to the poor person? Well, he'd have tried to get a return on it. He'd have invested it. He invested it in production. So that dollar would have gone to what? To paying the wages of a worker. So you didn't take that dollar out of the pocket of the rich person. You took that dollar out of the pocket of the forgotten man, the industrious worker. And you gave it to the pauper, who is 
simply taking up space. We see a drunkard in the street. A policeman comes up, a homeless man. He picks him up, he takes him to a shelter. We feel we've done a good thing. But who paid for that? The cab driver, who has to pay a special licensing fee and a special tax to pay the salary of the cop and for the, uh, the social workers. So the basic principle of all these reforms is that they're the redistributing wealth, which is always a zero-sum game, in which the forgotten man is the loser. Today, who is the forgotten man? What do we call him? We call him the middle class. That's the essence of our argument. The middle class is being forced to carry everyone. The deep point of this, social Darwinism, because of its break with Christianity, allowed us to re-examine the, the uh, morality of the, the tale of the prodigal son. Right, where the, the good son works hard all day and sacrifices and the, you know, the profligate son goes off and he comes back and he gets all the, the party and all the goodies from the other son. And uh, I've never seen that that was just. And that's exactly the point someone's raising, too. Like, if you want to go out and have a party, why should I pay for it? Well, perhaps Sumner's most damning critique of state amelioration is um, his belief that you never, in fact, achieve social improvement by direct effort. The great improvements in society have always been through the increase of technology. What will do more good for people, all this, for, the, for the really wretched of the earth? All the social schemes of amelioration or the development of better surgical techniques and anesthetics? The latter, which is never something you can plan. Well, I want to conclude now, very briefly, with what's the legacy of social Darwinism? Three things. One, it rejects the classical, traditional Christian idea of social organicism and hierarchy, right? Like Nietzsche and, Dar and Dewey, other people affected by Darwin, social Darwinism is all about the individual and the cultivation of individuality. Secondly, social Darwinism embodies the classically liberal critique of the state and power that begins with Locke and, and now results in, today, classical libertarianism. And social Darwinists, to their credit, opposed prohibitionary legislation, sumptuary legislation, moral legislation, uh, legislation that fostered corporate development, and finally, imperialism. At the bottom of this libertarian perspective is a profoundly optimistic belief in the productive powers of mankind and their ability to constantly generate progress. And I want to end with a quote. Every improvement in education, science, art, or government expands the chances of man on Earth. Such expansion is no guarantee of equality. On the contrary, if there be liberty, some will profit by the chances eagerly, and some will neglect them altogether. Therefore, the greater the chances, the more unequal will be the fortune of these two sets of men. So it ought to be, in all justice and right reason. But if we can expand the chances, we can count on a general and steady growth of civilization and advancement of society by and through its best members.